Bear witness that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah of Arabia, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings of God be upon him, is the messenger of God. The God of Abraham, not the moon God or the Arab God or the God of the Middle East. No, the Lord of the heavens and the earth. Adonai Elohim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, prostrated himself on the Mount of Olives and worshipped God, that is the same God, we believe, who sent Muhammad, peace be upon him, six centuries later. I believe the Prophet was who he claimed to be. He said, Ana Sayyidul Bani Adam, Wala Fakhri. I am the master of the children of Adam, and I do not boast. He said, Ana Khayr al I am the best of creation. We believe that he's better than the Kaaba in Mecca. He's better than the angels. He's better than the Temple of Solomon. He's better than paradise. You see, when the Prophet was preaching in Mecca, his tribe, the Quraysh, they would send messengers to the outlying borders of the city to intercept visitors, to spread lies and slanders about him. Right? And then these same people, right, they would say, stay away from this man Muhammad. He's a sahir, he's a sorcerer, he's going to bewitch you. These same people would seek out the Prophet, actually listen to what he says, you know, listen to him, and they would convert to Islam on the spot. You see, they met the Prophet's enemies before they had met him. The vast majority of Americans have never really met the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They've only heard what his enemies have said about him. And you can never rely on your enemy to give you an objective, unprejudiced, disinterested account of anything. Mr. Wood's criticisms and polemics are nothing new. The Western Orientalists have vilified the Holy Prophet for hundreds of years. Montgomery Watts says, of all the world's great men, none has been so much maligned as Muhammad, end quote. Yet the Prophet's message continues to resonate in the hearts of the faithful and Islam continues to grow. How? Because God tells the Prophet in the Quran, Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas, and God will defend and protect you from the violence and slanders of men. The Prophet's defense counsel is God himself. The skeptic like Mr. Wood cannot possibly entertain such a notion. So he concludes that Muslims must not know the so-called truth about Muhammad. No, we know the truth. It's no secret. It's no, Karen Armstrong says, we know more about Muhammad than about, about the founder of any other major religion. He's the only historical prophet. Now, the, only, the, the most important thing tonight is to be objective and balanced in our critical methodology. You see, the typical Christian critique of the prophet of Islam is extremely superficial, surface level, and one-dimensional. Things are looked at purely at face value, and then the worst possible motives are ascribed to them, which in reality is only a reflection of the mental depravity of the criticizers. If a psychiatrist shows you an ink blot and all you see is sex and violence, the problem is you. Deaf, dumb, and blind, they have no sense. But it's not your fault. I understand. You are what you read. The Bible is an anthology of sex and violence. So, you know, a man with hepatitis, he doesn't go around blaming other people because they look yellow. He has a disease in his eyes. He is the problem. He perceives the world through his own diseases. So Mr. Wood's, Mr. Wood's analysis is not surprising. This is a man, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, who is widely regarded by many scholars of Western academia as the most influential human being to ever step foot on the earth for all of the earthly work of all of the previous prophets put together is not equal to what this one man achieved. D. Brown, a Christian missionary, says, by any standard, Muhammad's achievements were little short of miraculous. Will we just dismiss him on a superficial level? R.B. Smith says that the Prophet was absolutely unique in history. That's a Christian missionary talking. His life is based on history, not mythology or conjecture. And it's not enough to say he was a great genius, he was a, a good statesman, he was a military hero. There's a lot more to this man. Alphonse de la Martin says in the history of Turkey, quote, that is Muhammad as regards all standards by which human greatness may be measured. We may well ask, is there any man greater than he? God reminds the Prophet of this very fact in the Quran. Have we not raised high the esteem in which thou art held? Dr. William Montgomery Watt, who died last year at age 97, widely regarded as the last of the great Western Orientalists, in an interview conducted in 1999, in his 90th year, he finally conceded, quote, I believe that Muhammad, like the earlier prophets, had genuine religious experiences. As such, I believe that the Qur'an came from God." End quote. In his book, Muhammad at Mecca, he says, to suppose Muhammad an imposter creates more problems than it solves. And finally, Annie Basant, a non-Muslim, 
and author of the book, The Life and Teachings of Muhammad, concludes, it is impossible for anyone who studies the life and character of the great prophet of Arabia, who knows how he taught and how he lived, to feel anything but reverence for that mighty prophet, one of the greatest messengers of the Supreme. When the prophet was 12 years old, it was a Christian in Syria who first noticed signs of prophecy in him, Bahira the monk. When he was 40 years old, the first man to testify to his messengership was a Christian scribe, Waraka bin Nofa. Look at the irony. Mr. Wood says in one of his uh, articles online that in the Meccan period, the prophet Muhammad was, quote, humble, devout, obedient, faithful, peaceful, and an outstanding moral example, end quote. You see, the vast majority of the Christian criticisms against the Holy Prophet originate from the Medinan period of the Prophet's life. In other words, the last nine or ten years of his life. And these primarily revolve around two issues, his marriages and the application of sacred law. The fundamental Christian questions are, how does Muhammad, peace be upon him, go from a suffering preacher prophet in Mecca to a sword-wielding warrior? in Medina? How does he go from a passively resistant monogamist to an actively resistant polygamist? The Muslim follow-up question is, did the Prophet change or did the external circumstances change? And that Muhammad couldn't tell the difference between a revelation from God and a revelation from Satan. Those are problems. It's also inter interesting to note that at one point late in life, Muhammad was the victim of a magic spell that lasted about a year. According to several passages in al-Bukhari, one of the Jews stole Muhammad's hairbrush and used it to cast a spell on him. Ibn Ishaq tells us that Muhammad was bewitched during this time, and al-Bukhari adds that the spell made him delusional. So according to Muslim sources, God's greatest prophet was under a spell for a year. And so we look at the historical records and we find, one, that Muhammad originally thought that he was demon-possessed, two, that he became suicidal, when he started receiving his revelations, three, that he delivered verses from Satan, and four, that people could cast spells on him. Muslims look at all of this and say, no big deal. I look at it and say, maybe there's something wrong here. Second, Muslims claim fairly regularly that Muhammad was a man of peace. I have absolutely no clue what sources they're reading when they say this. The early Muslim records are filled with acts of extreme brutality by Muhammad and his followers. Assassinations, executions, beheadings, torture. We find, people, we find Muhammad ordering people to uh, assassinate people for writing poetry against Islam. We find Muhammad ordering, his um, ordering people to assassinate people for insulting him. I'll give you a few examples. Kaab bin al-Ashraf was a Jewish merchant. He never physically attacked Muhammad or his followers, but he did write some pretty harsh poetry. So one day Muhammad ordered his men to assassinate Kaab, and they did. They cut him from his stomach down to his groin over poetry. According to Muslim sources, a man named Abu Afaq, who was more than a hundred years old, wrote a poem criticizing the Muslims. Muhammad said, who will deal with this rascal for me? Salim agreed to do it. He waited until Abu Afaq was asleep, and he stabbed him through the liver over poetry. When a woman named Asma heard that Muhammad had murdered an old man for writing a poem, she wrote a poem in retaliation. She called on people around her to stand up to Muhammad. When Muhammad heard about it, he said, who will rid me of Marwan's daughter? Umair agreed to do it. He went into her room, found her with her five children, one of whom she was breastfeeding, and he stabbed her to death over poetry. When one of Muhammad's followers heard a man say that he would never accept Islam, the Muslim took a bow and drove it through the man's eyeball, through his brain, and out the back of his head. Muhammad blessed his follower for his dedication. Muhammad once told his men to execute a slave girl who wrote a song making fun of him, and they did. A man named al Huayrith was executed for insulting Muhammad. A woman named Sarah was trampled to death by a horse for insulting Muhammad. One day after conquering a city, Muhammad ordered his followers to torture a man named Kanana because he was hiding money and the Muslims wanted it. Muhammad told them to light a fire on Kanana's chest until he told them where the money was. Then they cut off his head. As Muslims in the room know, the Quran allows men to have sex with their slave girls and female captives, those whom your right hands possess. To give you an example of how this practice was carried out, when the Mustalik, 
Muhammad allowed his men to have sex with the women they captured, even though these women were about to be sold into slavery. It's also important to note that the families of these women had just been slaughtered by Muslims, and yet it was perfectly acceptable for Muslims to have sex with these grieving women who were about to become slaves. Now that's just a sample of the details we find in the early Muslim literature. There are much, there's much more we could talk about. Muhammad winning converts by robbing caravans. Muhammad beheading hundreds of Jews who tried to defend themselves when they realized they were being eliminated. And so on. But you get the picture. Third, let's talk about Muhammad's wives. Surah 4.3 says that Muslims can marry up to four women. But we know from history that Muhammad had a lot more than four wives. So why did Muhammad get more? al Tabari puts the number at 15. Um, we know from references in, in Abu Qari that Muhammad had at least nine wives at one time. So why did Muhammad get more? The answer is found in Surah 3350, which says that Muhammad, and only Muhammad, could have as many wives as he wanted. So the Quran lays down a rule for Muslims saying they can have up to four wives, but Muhammad receives another revelation giving him and him alone special moral privileges, namely lots of women. If you believe in the Quran, there's no problem here. God just wanted Muhammad to have more wives than his followers could have. But for those of us who aren't Muslims, I have to say this looks awfully suspicious when a prophet receives revelations and those revelations give him more sexual partners than other people. Another concern I'll point out here is Muhammad's relationship with Aisha. It's a historical fact that Muhammad had sex with his nine-year-old wife, Aisha. The question is, what do we do with it? Now, I think that we do need to understand that this was a different culture and a different time and that we need to consider this when we, when we try to make judgments. But at the same time, Muhammad is supposed to be the greatest man who's ever lived, an example for all mankind for all time. And I think that many people in this room would agree with me when I say that history's greatest man probably shouldn't be having sex with a girl who, according to Muslim records, was still playing with dolls. Now, please don't misunderstand me when I raise these criticisms. I'm not trying to convey the idea that Muhammad was a completely horrible person. I don't think he was. Muhammad had many good qualities. He was dedicated to prayer, to fasting, to helping orphans.